said that I want to introduce our brother. Brother John is our guest speaker. Let's give him a warm welcome. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Anthony. That's a, that's a servant. That's a great, great man, servant of God. Grateful for the opportunity to stand before you here. And I uh, want to just start right in somewhat. Taking the, uh, the time here. Should have had the Bible all set. But anyway, we're going, we're going with the Genesis, so you don't have to go far. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, there's a lot here. And I want to start on verse 7. And we're going to go all the way to the end. And I read, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground, and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree, pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there, it divided and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Hevela, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure. Bedillium and Onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Jehan, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, which runs east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on that day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and, each, and brought each to, to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all of the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found as his complement. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother, and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked and yet felt no shame. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that uh, is here in the Bible. I thank you, God, for this day, this day that we can hear your word again, that your spirit can flow. And I ask you, Lord, to flow through me. I ask you, Lord, to speak through me, Lord, your truth. You use me however you want to use me, but let it be your word that comes forth, Lord. I ask you, Lord God, to, to guide all that we do here as we uh, go over your word. I ask you, Lord God, to make it clear. I ask you, Lord God, uh, to conform us more into your image. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I want to give thanks, first of all, to God the Father, the author of these scriptures the father of all of us. And I want to give thanks to all the fathers in the house. Fathers in the house. <laughs> hey, I want to thank you. Hey, hey, that's my assistant over there. Praise God for him. He actually bought me this tie here. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I want to thank Rachel, my wife. Now, she's not a father, but she was essential to make me a father. I want to thank my children, John, Rachel, Zach, Christina and Lauren, 
uh, those, those five folks uh, helped make me uh, a better person. And uh, they saw an imperfect man uh, trying to live for God, uh, but really they made my job uh, not a painful job, made it an honor. And so I'm grateful for, for them as well. I want to thank Pastor Andrew for actually trust and trusting me uh, to stand, stand here. And uh, Pastor Andrew Provazic, uh, the, the, he's the under shepherd of this, this house here, this house of prayer. And I'm, and I'm grateful for him as well. And, uh, and I want to thank everyone who is either watching or is either sitting here uh, listening to me. And uh, I really don't want to waste your time, so I want to get right into uh, the message. And so what we all read from Genesis chapter 2, it ended with the first usage of the word that was translated father. The first usage in the scriptures, in the Bible. And so the entire book of Genesis, as well as the next four books, call them the, the Pentateuch, they were all written by Moses. So this second chapter gives an overview of creation, and then it focuses on the creation of Adam and then Eve. Now, I happen to be one who actually believes the whole book, believes that whole Bible. And I believe this account of the creation of man and woman. And as this is Father's Day, I think, and our pastor also thinks, a message about fathers is most fitting. So before we go any further into the message, I'll give you an overview. This will let you know where we are as far and also where we're going. Uh, this message has three parts, each part remaining particularly tied to what God says in the Bible. So I'll begin with God as Father, God as Father, the Chief Father. And next, I'll discuss man as Father. And then I'll end with man as a son. And so if you focus on God as father, you'll know what a father is and what a father does. And so this should be for any man who wants to be a father one day or one who is a father. You say, what do I do as a father? So you ask yourself, what is a father and what does a father do? So according to Strong's Concordance, the word that was translated here, father, in Genesis 2.24, is the Hebrew word transliterated ab, A-B. And the phonetic spelling is A-W-B or ab. I guess that's how, how it's uh, pronounced in Hebrew. So the Oxford American writer of the source definition is male parent, begetter, patriarch. Several other definitions will pop up, but the one that sticks mostly to me is male progenitor or male originator of anything. That's a father. So you say, hey, I'm the father of modern music. It's a male who apparently did something with music. I'm the father of modern medicine. It's a male that did something to start modern medicine. So again, back to focusing with to God as a father, once you realize that God is the progenitor of absolutely everything. In that sense, God is the father unlike any who would call themselves father after him. God is the supreme and perfect model of what it is to be father. The first words of the Bible make this plain. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the Gospel of John, it's written revealing Jesus, the Son of God, the Father. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And so in the most simplistic of terms, God is the originator of everything. Nothing came before God. God's very existence depended upon nothing. So this concept may be difficult to wrap one's brain around because there's an origin to everything we know and have. I heard Tony Evans once say something to the effect of only God is the source. Everything else is a resource. So since God is the originator of everything, 
and everyone in the universe, everyone and everything belongs to God and owes its very existence to God. The word says, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So it's further confirmed in Psalm chapter 50. It says, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. So hopefully you have this sense of who God is as father. He's the originator of mankind. He's the originator of everything in the universe. So what does God or what does scripture tell us that God actually does as father? What does he do? So I submit to you that God as father does many things. However, in the main text that we went over and in the rest of scripture, it supports three main actions that God does as father. One, God loves. Two, God leads. And three, God leaves a legacy. So anyone who really knows God, they know that God loves. Anyone who reads the Bible will be extremely hard-pressed to deny that Holy Scripture says God loves. In fact, love is God's very nature. If you read this passage from the Amplified Version of the Bible, it makes this point noticeably clear. It says, the one who does not love does not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know him, for God is love. He is the originator of love, and it is an enduring attribute of his nature. So in our main text, Genesis chapter 2, the love of God is displayed in creating man in his image, giving him life, providing for his every need, giving him purpose, and this most profound act of love. Moses wrote from a text, God said, I will make him a helper suitable for him. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man. And brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. So this scripture is quoted again in the New Testament by Jesus and also by Paul. And we'll go into that later on in this message. But God is perfect. God's the perfect example of perfect love. As we'll see later, the scriptures show the depth of this perfect love. It is actually beyond comprehension. What is arguably the most telling attribute showing love is the compassion that God, the perfect love, has for his children. God had uniquely, had this uniquely close relationship with, with Moses. And I was telling my wife yesterday, it's like, man, I wish, I wish God spoke to me like he spoke to Moses, face to face. And Moses wrote about his experiences when he was taking the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they were going through the desert. I mean, he was, he was close with God. And God would, would meet him in this tent, this tent of meeting. And he would go out and the cloud would come down and, and the people would go out and worship because they would see the presence of God. But God would talk to him just like I'm talking to you face to face. You know, God doesn't talk to people like that now. He talks through his word. He talks by his spirit. But sometimes you get it wrong because you didn't hear him face to face. Sometimes even as a, a person trying to walk like Christ, trying to live like Christ, uh, I thought I heard him do this. But Moses didn't have that issue. He talked to him face to face. 
But the people says, people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent. All the people would rise and worship, each at the entrance of the tent. Uh, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. And then that next chapter, Moses wrote about God and revealing himself. And Moses, Moses declared, God, the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate, back to the compassionate, and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Compassion, according to my Webster's Dictionary, is defined as pity, aroused by the distress, the distress of others, with the desire to help him. And so because God has compassion and he abounds in compassion, uh, we as his children will call out to him and out of his compassion, because he said he was compassionate, he shows his compassion. And I'm, I'm 58 years old. I have seen the compassion. I've seen the mercy of God because I've needed it. I've been in distress often. I've been in distress often and not knowing where to go. And I've called out to God and he's been faithful. And I know somebody else can, can get be a witness to that because it's, it's true. He is a compassionate God. He's full of mercy. And, uh, and so, yes, it says uh, he has this desire to help those in distress. And there's much more I can be said that can be said about God as the perfect father showing love. But we also must explore how God leads. God is the supreme example of a father who leads his people, who leads his children. There's no shortage of books about leadership. I've read several, and we could spend days discussing this topic alone. However, in my opinion, one of the best books on this topic is titled The Servant, a simple story about the true essence of leadership by James C. Hunter. Now, on page 28 of my Kindle, it says, quotes, leadership, the skill of influencing people to work enthusiastically toward goals identified as being for the common good. And Hunter goes on in this story to discuss influence by power and by authority. Now, God is the perfect example of a father who leads by both power and authority. Power, the power of God, is actually infinite. When you can speak and everything comes to being, that's infinite power. So he has infinite power, no limit on his power, no rival, <laughs> as the song says. But he also has authority. And the authority, that's the right to do something, the right to say something, the right to be something. But his authority is also supreme. So by virtue of him being perfect in character, perfect in wisdom, perfect in knowledge, perfect in understanding, and also being before anything and everything, and also being the owner of everything, he has supreme authority. If you own something, you can do with it what you want. You know, I own this 11-year-old this car out there, you know. If, if, if I want to take my key and just scratch the side of it, <laughs> I have the authority to do that because it's my car. I have the title deed to my car. But everything belongs to God. And so God has the right, the authority to do whatever he wants with everything. But the thing also, think about his character. Just because has, he has the right to key someone, he can key my life because of his compassion, because of his love, because of his grace. He's not just going to uh, key my life. He's going he's gonna to show love. He's going to be faithful to the rest of his scriptures. And so you don't have to fear the authority of God. You can trust the authority of God. You can trust the power of God. He says a great example that God shows or how he leads his children is how a shepherd leads his sheep. Psalm 23 discusses the relationship of God with his children as an analogy of a shepherd with his sheep. David, King David, wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness 
for his name's sake. An important part of leading is correcting. David continues in this analogy as he wrote, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff are the things that a shepherd uses to correct the sheep when they go astray. As will be presented, when we get to man as father, hatred is actually shown by not correcting your children. The whole of Scripture is given to God's children to lead them into all truth. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. A third action the perfect father does is leave a legacy. God, as the perfect father, left his children a legacy. A good father considers the future of his children and leaves them something that will benefit them in years to come. After Adam and Eve fell into sin, which is what happened in the next chapter, God told them that he left them the promise of the Savior. Moses records God telling the serpent in cloak language, he said, quote, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So this was actually the promise of spiritual, that this spiritual death position where they were would not continue. God, as the perfect father, provided his own son as the seed of a woman to be the savior to redeem mankind. Isaiah prophesied, therefore, the Lord God himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel means God with us. David further illustrates God leaving a legacy in Psalm 23. He wrote of the Lord, his shepherd, quote, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I want to just take an aside about that particular scripture. I went through periods of life as, as a young person, <laughs> uh, uh, walking and live, living in and out of sin, in and out of sin. And I was worried, man, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to die one of these days, and I just, I just didn't get it right, you know, I'm just going to get caught out there. And, it's like, and so I'd go every Sunday. They have an altar call. I'd be up there getting saved again. Getting saved again. And then, and then, you know, Friday, Saturday night, I, I mess up. And, and, I'm, and I'm going, and Sunday, got to get saved again. And then all of a sudden, I, I read this scripture. And you know about David's life. David uh, had had relations uh, with another woman, had the, hus had the husband killed to cover it up. But this man still writes, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And it, turned, it changed my life. And say, wait a minute. If this person sins and he repents and he comes back and he's going to leave, he didn't lose that salvation. He didn't lose that relationship. He lost that closeness when he sinned. But he didn't lose who he was. God made him his child. And God made a legacy out of his life. And so this whole thing about you're going to dwell in the house. And this is, this is not some, some one-bedroom flat that, that you have a, a, a hope of. This is a house. This is a, a big house. This is a mansion that you have the hope for in the end. And you're going to dwell there forever. And this is a promise. This is a promise that you can hold on to. That I, if, if you're his child, you're going to be with him. 
If you're his child, you're going to be with him. Let me get on back here. So, so to confirm that God's children have a legacy, Paul wrote in the book to the church at Rome. He wrote, quote, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs. Also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be also glorified with him. And Peter, he wrote of the inheritance of those in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And so it's just not going to be spent. It's not going to be lost. And, and so that is the inheritance of those who are in Christ. It is an imperishable. It is an undefiled. It is, a, a, it is a, an inheritance that will not fade away. And it is reserved in heaven for you. So since we have discussed the perfect father, let's discuss men as fathers and future fathers. So I submit to you, Every man who strives for perfection in being a father should also love, lead, and leave a legacy. I believe if one boils down the biggest challenges and the problems facing people today, one would find sin at the heart. From the angle of the role of a father in these problems, they stem from a failure of fathers to love, to lead, or to leave a legacy. On 28th September, that was actually the date my, my, my babies <laughs> were born, the 28th of September, but not in 1972. I was actually eight years old at this time, or seven years old. Yeah, 58. So uh, according to Wikipedia, an R&B group named The Temptations released a song on their album, All Directions, with the title, Papa Was a Rolling Stone. The song was written by Norman Whitfield and Baird Strong and eventually reached number one on the Billboard Hot Chart and won three Grammy Awards in 1973. It was originally performed by another group in, uh, with a Motown label named The Undisputed Truth. Now, I believe this song was so popular because it figured, uh, figuratively and literally struck a chord with so many people. The chorus said, Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. And when he died, all he left us was alone. All he left us was alone. So this is an example of a man who failed to love, he failed to lead, and he failed to leave a legacy. And so many people identified with that, that that song got all kinds of airplay. And, and so, yeah, maybe most of you are, are too young to remember that song, but I remember the song. But fathers, if you think about the difference that you would make in the lives of your children if you would love, if you would lead, and if you would leave them a legacy. It would make all the difference. So let's start with love. The first and overarching act of a father, I would submit to you, is loving your wives. Not just physically, but sacrificially. Paul wrote by the Holy Spirit, quote, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul went on to explain how everyone who is regenerated, a regenerated child of God, is placed in the body of Christ. And Christ loves his body. 
and he loves his body sacrificially. Paul continued on. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. He then goes on to quote from our verse, Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 6 through 12, Jesus quotes this same passage. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But he was addressing the Pharisees. They came and asked him, hey, is it okay for me to just divorce my wife? I get tired of her. She burned a toast. I can kick her out, you know. And, and, uh, and Jesus answered him with that scripture. From the beginning... It wasn't so. From the beginning, he made the male and female. And he says, from the beginning, those two, those two were to become one flesh. And he says, well, what God joined together, let not man put asunder. But in, in short, divorce is an example of not loving your wife. And it also leads to adultery. So love, I submit to you, is that umbrella for also leading and leaving a legacy. The father is expected to lead his wife and children, not just by power, but by authority. The main way an earthly father leads, using his power, that is, is the power that God gives us to make wealth. To earn a living. The Bible says, I quote, otherwise, you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. The loving leader leads mostly by virtue of his character, not his power. He leads by authority. He leads because he follows. Paul ties in this truth as he wrote, Wives, be subject to your husbands as, a, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. This order is delineated clearly in scripture. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And so that man needs to be following Christ. And the man is the head of a woman. And God is the head of Christ. And so that's the order. So fathers, I submit to you that wives and children will be greatly hindered in trusting your leadership if they fail to see a radical and consistent submission to Jesus Christ. If they can't see that you die daily to yourself, and that you would willingly die for any one of them, it will be hard, if not impossible, for them to want to go where you're going. As I said before, a good way to show that you hate your child is to fail to discipline them. God said, my son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. I, I quote again, he who withholds his rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Quote again, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. I quote again, do not hold back discipline from your child. Although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. You shall strike him with the rod and rescue his soul from Sheol. The word Sheol is a Hebrew word for the underworld. 
or the, the abode of the dead. In short, the rod of correction rescues your child from death. And I want to tell you a story of my life. I grew up in Pontiac, Michigan. And I, I was born there in 1965, and I lived in this, in this area in Pontiac, Michigan, up until I was about 10 years old. But when I was eight years old, about eight, maybe seven or eight years old, uh, I was actually getting bullied. I was getting bullied by Boo-Boo. Boo-Boo was a girl, and she, she, was, she was tough and, uh, and tougher than I was. And she was bullying me, and I didn't want to be bullied anymore. And so I, in my own wisdom, had an idea. I'm going to stop this bullying. So I, uh, I knew my dad had a, a loaded shotgun or rifle that was stood up behind the door of, the, of their bedroom. So I went and got that thing. And just imagine this little seven, eight-year-old with a real rifle that was loaded and I'm barely carrying this thing out, outside. I'm going to show boo-boo something, <laughs> you know? I barely get this, this rifle up. I'm just like barely holding this thing. I can barely get it up. I remember it was a strain to get it up on the, on the banister, the porch banister. And, and, and I had pointed it at her house, you know? I was, I was, I, boo-boo's, boo's going to show me some respect, you know? It's one of the dumbest things you could ever do. I could have fallen with that gun. I, that gun could have just gone off, or <laughs> somebody from Boo Boo's house could have seen me pointing the rifle and shot me. You know, it's just some stupid foolishness bound up in the heart of the child. Foolishness. And so, yes, my mom and dad showed me love. <laughs> they showed their love for me with the rod. In my case, it was the belt of correction. You know? And I, uh, I praise God, I praise God that they didn't have this, this modern view of how you raise your kids. And, and as if the Bible isn't true. He made us. He owns us. He knows what's right. He, I'm not dead. The rod didn't kill me. But I remember the story so I can tell it 50 years later. I remember that. I don't mess with guns. I don't play with guns. I, I, I will qualify when I need to qualify, <laughs> but I'm not playing with a gun. I'm not just going to pull it out to show, to get somebody to respect me. But I praise God for his correction. I praise God for his truth. So let me talk about leaving a legacy. So in Proverbs, it says, a good man leaves inheritance to his children's children. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. And so you can just look at this verse and say, hey, God wants every man make a ton of money and then leave it for you know, the great, great grandchildren. You know, that's, that's what God wants. This is, it's in the Bible. <laughs> but I submit to you that the whole Bible doesn't support just chasing after money. And in fact, Paul warns about the love of money. Paul warns to Timothy when he says, the love of money, that is, the greedy desire for it and the willingness to gain it unethically is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it to have, wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through and through with many sorrows. You just can't radically follow after money and radically follow after God. So this is really a separate sermon in itself, talking about, you know, money and, 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 and chasing after money and chasing after God. Um, but the most important legacy a father can leave their children is the example of a life lived truly submitted to Christ. That's a legacy or an inheritance that cannot be stolen or squandered. However, the memory and the blessings of the life of that father can and will be passed on for generations to come. And so you think about the man, the father, who's totally submitted to God, totally submitted to Christ as his Lord. God is going to bless that man. And those children are going to receive the blessings 
that result from this man following Christ, submitting his life to Christ in a radical way. You know, you can't be God-giving, but you're going to know how to live as you follow Christ. So I'm going to conclude with talking about man as a son. And so this portion of the message includes the ladies as well, as well as the men. As we all know, God made both male and female in his image. It says, quote, so God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. However, if we are honest with ourselves, we neither look nor act like God, our father. This is because our earthly father, Adam, left us all a legacy. And it's the legacy of a sin nature. Our natural tendency is to sin and run from God, our original father. The prophet Isaiah wrote, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Now, I really hope you're asking in your mind, who is the him on whom all of our iniquity has fallen? Isaiah continued to write, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. It's from Isaiah 53. The righteous one Isaiah wrote about is Jesus. The reason as it reads, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, that's after he dies, Jesus offers himself as a supreme sacrifice for sin. God actually raised him from the dead to live forever. And so this, this is the time, we call this the altar call. God, the perfect original father, loves us, leads us, and left us a legacy of eternal life. The problem brought by our father Adam is that we're all born into this hopeless condition of spiritual death. We're all born separated from God. However, out of God's great love, he showed compassion and offered Jesus, his son, before he even made us. That is a separate sermon, of course. But I hope you can just trust that the fall of man didn't shock God. It didn't surprise God. He didn't say, oh, man, I got to go with a plan B. John wrote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Paul wrote that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord over all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. The truth has been passed down. This truth of who Jesus is and what he left us and how he loved us, it was a, a truth that was passed down to me. My mom and dad told me that. Rachel and I told our five kids that. And, and we're actually, I believe we're the parents of six kids. I believe we're going to see one in heaven. But we share this truth. And this truth has changed our lives. And we pray that God will bless our five with, with children and that they'll share this truth with them and that their life will be changed. But I'm not your father. 
But I am sharing this truth with you, that God does love you, that God does lead perfectly, and he's left you a legacy of eternal life. But he loves you compassionately. And so if you accept this truth, the truth of what he's left you, it's a legacy of eternal life by being in his son, the Messiah. Please join me in prayer. God, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your legacy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for this beautiful day that we get to see, this day that you made. I ask you, Lord God, to bless the remainder of it. And if anyone doesn't know you, Lord, I ask you, God, to let them call upon you according to your word and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, boy. Go ahead and stay right up here. No, up here. Stay with me. Hey, yeah. Uh...